Thank you. Okay. All good. Thank you and welcome. It's such a, uh, a pleasure and a privilege to present at this Curious Thinkers event of Cuscals today and I'm pleased to be presenting to you the insights from my new book which I've just published called Youthquake 4.0, A Whole Generation and a New Industrial Revolution. Now the central question I'm going to get you to think about as we go through this presentation is how do we increase our capacity to adapt in a world of accelerated change? Now to address that question, I'm going to introduce to you two words. The first is youthquake. And a friend of mine, uh, I asked this question to a little while ago. I, said, I asked him, I said, do you know what this word youthquake means? And he thought it was a type of headache that kids give their parents. And I said, no, it's actually last year's Oxford Dictionary 2017 Word of the Year. And it's defined as a significant cultural, technical, political change associated with a young demographic. And here I'll be applying that word to millennials, which are those that are broadly aged between 18 to 34 years. Now, the research that I've applied in the book covers a wide range of millennials across 186 countries and 30,000 of them. So it's very, very significant. The second part of the question um, relating to our capacity to adapt to a world of accelerated change the second word I'll introduce you to is juvenescence. Now, juvenescence is my 2017 word of the year. And it stands for and is defined as the state of youthfulness. And what I'll be talking about here is that we need to move beyond thinking about enterprise and digital transformation as though it's an end state, because the reality is is that we've got to be able to get our organisations to live in an environment where they have to constantly change and constantly evolve. And so what I'm going to do is talk about demographic change, but I'm going to talk about millennials in four ways. We're going to look at how they are influencing our world. We're going to think about that demographically, we're going to think about that economically, we're going to think about that technologically, and we're going to think about that in the workplace. We're then going to pause and stop and reflect upon the single biggest issue facing our world in terms of trust and the erosion of trust across our institutions, be they spiritual, be they commercial, or be they political. And what idea I'll be presenting to you is that our conventions and notions of trust were never designed to fit a digital life and a digital world. And we have to rethink our conventions of identity. We have to rethink our notions of trust as though it's a renewable energy. We're then going to talk about enterprises, and we're going to talk about enterprises from a juvenescence perspective. We're going to look at the environment upon which organisations now have to find ways to exist within. So I'm going to begin by just sort of presenting with you a idea and acknowledging that intergenerational comparison, which we often find we tend to do, particularly with millennials, is not something new. This, in fact, is human behaviour. Intergenerational comparison has been going on for quite some time. Now, millennials attract a disproportionate level of it, but what I would say is that we've got to look at how generations are influenced. And the first most important thing we need to think about when it comes to millennials is the adults or the, 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 the parents who influenced who they are and the world with which their parents grew up in. So if we think about baby boomers growing up in the mid-60s, this was a very significant cultural and social change that swept right across the world. And it was, in fact, that era which gave rise to the word youthquake. And youthquake was first termed by the editor-in-chief of Vogue magazine to explain this phenomena in the 60s that was sweeping across Europe, the United States, and then the rest of the world. And so it's only natural then that we th when we look at millennials and we think about the influence on their lives, it was these parents who grew up in the 60s who have given rise to this sort of revolutionary new generation. And this, uh, this generation is now growing up in a new boom associated with technology as opposed to their parents who grew up 
in a um, in an economic boom. The point that I want to make here is the significance of cultural, social, and political change is very profound as we stare into our future of our world as it was back then in the 60s. Now, if we think about then influence, which is where we're going to go to, I'm going to begin by just seeding this notion with you that putting aside the stereotypes, putting aside the generalisations, the future prosperity of any nation, of any industry, or of any organisation can in fact be found in the promise of its youth. And I would say this is a very important idea for you to think about in terms of the way with which your organisations need to think about their futures as well. So when it comes to looking at um, millennials, we often hear generalisations as, as though they're the entitled demographic. And what I would propose to you is that maybe if we think about them as an empowered demographic, we might see them, in fact, quite differently to, uh, to how they're generally uh, stereotyped. Now, let's look at them demographically. Millennials make up about two billion people on the planet, about one in three people in the global population. Their proportionate representation across all facets of society is only going to increase from this point on, be they your consumers, be they employees, be they policy makers, be they lawmakers. Their representation across all facets of society will only increase. Now, what's interesting, though, is when we think about them here in Australia, they make up 6.2 million people. So 6.2 million people don't eat smashed avocado on rye for breakfast every morning. And so it's important that we step away from the stereotypes because that's not helpful. Uh, we've got to remind ourselves that this demographic transcends three distinct life stages, the shift from youth to adulthood for most that occurs at the age of 18, although some mothers report to me that it takes a little bit longer for their Johnny to cross that, that inflection point. The second uh, life stage is then the shift um, from student life into professional life. And on average in Australia, that occurs around the 20 to three, 23 to 25 year mark. And then the third life stage, the most significant one, is the shift from single life to family life. And on average in Australia, that occurs at around the 30 years of age mark. Every time one of these life stages occurs, their needs change considerably. And so they simply cannot be homogenous. Now, when it comes to looking at their economic influence, I've created a measure uh, which hopefully will help sort of explain the economic significance of this, uh, of this demographic, millennials today have become the primary producer of income. Now, why is that important? It's important because their proportionate representation of the workplace today is only one in three. By 2020, they'll be two in three. Um, and so, as their proportionate representation of the work, uh, workplace increases, so will their income production capacity. And so, if you are thinking about where your future sources of deposits are going to come from, this is where they're going to come from. The second aspect that I'd ask you to have a think about is that this demographic will increasingly become the custodians of the world's capital. Today, globally, millennials make up and represent approximately 15% of the world's wealth. By 2020, that'll be 20%. This number is only going to increase through the course of time. And this demographic has completely different views about the role of enterprises and the way with which the world is investing its capital in terms of a better future. And so I've created a measure because that's what researchers love to do. And uh, this was looking at 15 countries, and the measure is based on what is the economic capacity of millennials relative to the average of the total population. So if you take someone's savings, what they have on deposit, and then if you add what they've lent uh, or got uh, outstanding in terms of loans, that gives you an average economic capacity measure. Now, the point that I'd make here is that millennials in Australia are within 5% of reaching the national average in terms of their economic capacity. They are on the cusp of becoming the most economically important and significant demographic to not just a financial institution, but to many others. Now, in China, they've already crossed that threshold. 400 million millennials 
in China now have much greater economic capacity than does the, the average across the population. In France, they've already reached that level, and in the UK, they're on the cusp of hitting that as well. So the point that I want to make to you is that millennials will increasingly exercise their economic strength through the course of time. Now, let's have a look at how they uh, influence the workplace. Now, there's many different ways that uh, we can think about our future sources of labour or human capital. But what we have before us is the first demographic who's grown up digitally. Uh, this demographic has a completely different way of working and they are demanding that they work for organisations who have completely different purposes or a higher order purpose. Now, what's important here is that this would have to be, this demographic would have to be one of the most underutilised assets and resources that the world has because only 62% of human capital is in fact fully utilised across the world, yet this demographic is the one that is, has the highest unemployment associated with that. So it's not by accident that one in two of them prefer to in fact work for themselves. Now, when it comes to looking at their technology influence, I refer to this as being the sixth sense. Um, and the realisation of this occurred when, um, when I was taking my kids, uh, in fact, to, um, to visit their nonna in Mildura. And we were driving up the Calder Highway, just the other side of Bendigo, and I was just watching this most wonderful Victorian countryside, rolling hills and sheep and a beautiful scenery. And then all of a sudden, a paddock appeared and there was 12 massive, shiny satellite dishes in this paddock. And it was the most unusual sight. And as I was looking at these, uh, uh, these satellite dishes, I was thinking to myself, oh, this, this must be a CSIRO or Department of Agriculture or some sort, sort of scientific uh, installation of some sort. Uh, but there was no uh, signage to indicate what it, in fact, was. And so I thought, well, the, the, the farmer either has an obsession with sport or some other form of content here. But anyway, I pointed it out to the kids, expecting um, some questions of physics or astronomy. And in perfect, synchronised harmony, they looked up from their devices, looked at this unusual site, and said, do you think we can get free Wi-Fi off it, Daddy? <laughs> and I realised in that moment that younger generations to them being connected is as natural as the air that they breathe. And that's the point that I'd make about we have a workforce that is so well equipped, that thinks very, very differently, uh, and yet is so, uh, is so underutilised. And so we can now start seeing that uh, their, a, a, a culturalisation to technology is playing out in their preferences and choices for where they work, how they engage in media. Their patience now, in terms of latency of applications, is now leading to some, uh, some new health uh, phenomena uh, referred to as selfie stress. And what's important, though, is they fully understand a lot of the new technologies that will be quite disruptive when it comes to you know, the fourth industrial revolution, technologies such as artificial intelligence, biotechnology and robotics and the like. Now, to put a little bit of colour to this, if you ever want to have a really good laugh, what I would suggest is hop onto YouTube and, and search for funny millennial videos because you'll have an afternoon of entertainment because the stereotyping associated with this, uh, this demographic is quite richly captured in a lot of those videos. Now, I'd like to show you uh, one of my favourites. Amy, it says you are trained in technology. That's very good. Are you adept at Excel? No. PowerPoint? No. Publisher? Not really. Exactly in what area of technology mm -hmm. are you proficient? <laughs> Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, Vine, Twitter, you know, the big ones. I'm surprised you didn't say Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's for old people, like my parents. <laughs> That's funny. Well, Amy, when you're working for me, 
you have to have those kind of research skills because I'll send you things for you to comb through and get the answers and send them to me. So for that, you've got to be really good at technology. For stuff like that, no problem. I'll just ask Siri. You'll you know, just ask Siri? You know, Siri tell me this, Siri find me that. We're all good getting you the answers. Tell Siri I want you ready to go at 8 sharp each and every morning. I don't understand. What don't you understand? What you just said. You don't understand? Be ready to go? No. You said eight, right? Yes. Eight like in the morning eight? Yes, in the morning. Yeah. That kind of doesn't work for me. Who gets up at eight? I do. I Skype with my French boyfriend in Paris until like three in the morning. I don't even get to Starbucks until like 10 where I order my grande chai tea latte, three pumps, skim milk, light water, 2% foam, extra hot, but not too hot. So if it's okay, I work best in the morning at 10.45. <laughs> wow. Amy, I don't think we're gonna be a good fit. Why are you so negative? I can sense your hostilities, and right now, I am not feeling very safe. I've been here for over five minutes, and the only nice thing you have said to me was nice resume, which I typed all night for this meeting with you. You've given me no guidance, no validation, no encouragement, no supervision. Is there an HR director somewhere? HR director? Yes, I need to speak to someone. I may have to take off today as a mental health day. Take the day off, you... Amy. Amy, look at me. You don't work here. <laughs> Are you firing me? <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. <sighs> so, there we go. Hope you had a, uh, a, a good laugh at that. Okay, let's talk about trust. As I mentioned, this issue is now, or the erosion of trust is now, probably the single biggest issue facing all of our institutional types uh, around the world. And I think where we've come to, we've really got to rethink the, the way we think about the role of trust in our society. And I would argue that trust is, in fact, uh, more important to us than money uh, as we think about our future. Now, what I talk about in the book is that we need to shift our way of thinking as though trust is somehow hierarchically based onto thinking about it in a more distributed manner. Now, if we think about trust along two dimensions, if we think about trust from an associative trust perspective, and if we just look at two of the attributes associated with that when it comes to fairness and honesty. According to millennials right around the world, the organisations and the institutions they trust the most are the academic institutions as well as the NGOs. Financial institutions, in fact, rank third last when it comes to fairness and honesty uh, in their world. But then when we look at cognitive trust, and we look at the attributes associated, who they trust the most when it comes to their personal information. We see financial institutions move from being third last along the associative uh, uh, line to all of a sudden being number one. Now, what's important when we think about privacy and security is that this is the most confronting issue that we have in our digital lives. Now, the point here is that no organisational type is meeting at least one in two millennials' expectations. And so the point here is that the whole cluster of organisations, such as the social media organisations, technology companies, are now coming into the trust sphere. And so the ideal opportunity that financial institutions have today in our current digital life is to be those organisations who people entrust with their uh, personal information and the privacy of their information more so going forward. But it won't just be some form of singularity. It will absolutely be in collaboration with others. Now, when we look at the workplace, there's three areas that I'll address. Purpose, inclusion and diversity. When it comes to purpose, millennials are looking for a higher order uh, connection with the organisations to whom they work for. Now, 
unlike generations before them, millennials see what they do in life as being intertwined into who they are. And that's why this emotional connection with purpose is so important and that's why a lot of the newer organisations they tend to gravitate to around this purpose. Now, when it comes to diversity, this is such an important area. Uh, now, today I'm just going to touch on one dimension of that, but the point and the idea that I present in the book is that gender diversity is no longer a social or a cultural debate or argument. It is, in fact, an economic debate and argument because there are organisations now across all industry sectors who outperform their competitors or peers based on the profile or the diversity profile of their, uh, of their organisations. And so we really need to sort of step back and have a think about this because closing out the gender diversity uh, uh, inequality that we have in our society is fundamental to millennials because they are also the most culturally diverse generation ever, benefiting from multicultural policies in the past, as well as uh, from a sexual diversity perspective as well. Uh, but one of the largest growth opportunities that the world has today is to close out this, uh, this gap that we've got in diversity. Okay, now, um, a quarter-life crisis. What is a quarter-life crisis? Now, some of you might be thinking it's about half what a midlife crisis is, and you're spot on. Uh, the quarter-life crisis is a relatively new phenomena, um, and it's emerged and played out with the millennial generation. And the reasons why it's played out is because they grew up and were led to believe that their future and the future of their success was based on a, uh, on a, on a linear three-tier model. Get educated, work and retire. Uh, and this is a, a dislocation with the reality upon which they're finding themselves. And so this state of juvenescence is a state that millennials are now finding themselves having to live within and structure their lives around now, if you're a 20-year-old millennial, you've got a one in two chance of living to 100 years. This is the first demographic that's going to see four generational families, constructs, emerge. So if you look at longevity, humans have been, uh, life expectancy has been increasing for humans since 1840, two years every decade linearly. And so if you play that out, Again, this is the first demographic that has a one in two chance of living to 100 years. So, get educated, work and retire is not going to cut it for this demographic because the likelihood of them retiring at 67 or 70 years of age is not going to be adequate for them. And so what I talk about in the book is that they're most likely going to go through replenishment stages. They will go through a multi-stage approach to how they think about changing careers because we can no longer reliably predict that the careers that we are in today are going to exist in the next 20 or 30 years. Okay, let's look at enterprise juvenescence. Um, now, survival uh, for enterprises, the average life of an enterprise has declined substantially. So if you look at the Fortune 500 organisations back in 1920, the Fortune 500 average life of 65 years. That's now down to 15 years. And so the point here is that the problem with the word transformation is that it implies or suggests a end date or a finish of some sort. But the reality is, is that you're in a world that is now constantly changing around you and so it's the ability of your organisation to in fact transform that makes all of the difference. Now exponential organisations are what are referred to as describing organisations who seem to scale so quickly from zero uh, these organisations grow and expand exponentially. On the left-hand side, you'll see these are the four forces that explain exponential performance. The information enablement, the acceleration of their growth. 
On the right-hand side there, the exponential organisations, the DNA of what makes up those organisations is now really well understood and the Singularity University has been leading those, uh, those worldwide because the environment that we are now living in is an environment where disruption is not a once-off event. It is the environment that we in fact live in and so the appearance and the occurrence of organisations that grow exponentially across all industries will only continue through the course of time. But we've got to get ready now because just as we're coming through the third industrial revolution, we now have another industrial revolution on our doorstep and the fourth industrial revolution is made up of the augmentation of our digital, physical and biological worlds. It will have, as the World Economic Forum describes, a impact that we've never seen before. Its speed, scale and impact uh, will affect all industries across all economies. These are the technologies that make up uh, the growth expected to be derived from the fourth industrial revolution and these are many technologies that you would be reading about that are impacting the financial services system, blockchain, artificial intelligence, automation, uh, the internet of things, these will dynamically change your industry as they will for other industries. Let's have a listen to what the WEF says about this. Okay, let me now bring this uh, to a summary. So, back to the question at hand. How do we increase our capacity to adapt to a world of accelerated change? And what I talk about in the book is that it is, in fact, uh, the symbiotic relationship between human capital uh, and the fourth industrial revolution that allows us to unlock a lot of the potential that this next revolution offers our businesses, our organisations uh, and, the, and the broader society. It's very important that we understand that the world in terms of its population is about to transition into a demographic who has completely different perspectives about the future of the world, organisations and institutions that, uh, that, are, that are part of it. The pace, the speed, scale and impact of technology is going to come at us at paces uh, that we have never seen before. And so it's important that you prepare your organisations not for a once-off event in terms of transformation, but prepare your organisation for juvenescence. That is, prepare your organisation to constantly evolve in a world that is constantly evolving. Now, all of the insights that I've shared with you today are captured in a book, and I just want to close by sharing with you a very, very significant quote uh, that uh, has been with me for all of my life, uh, because what we are talking about here is, in fact, the law of change. Um, and that is something that I think is the, one of the most empowering aspects 
of, uh, of what we do as humans because that is completely vested in our hands. And so, again, everything that I've uh, talked about is uh, contained in a book and Cuscal and Visa have gratefully made available a copy of the book for all of you here. So I hope that's been insightful and happy to take questions. Thank you.